I'm talking today to Steve Song, who is the founder of Village Telco, which produces a mesh Wi-Fi device called the Mesh Potato, which does both voice and data. Steve, tell me how this product came about. Well, um, I had started a fellowship at the Shuttleworth Foundation in South Africa to look at telecommunications and access issues. And uh, it rapidly became evident that um, the biggest barrier to affordable access in Africa was not actually uh, a technological one so much as a regulatory one, and that the regulatory frameworks in most African countries actually um, were a barrier to market entry, and as a result, the market's not very competitive. And uh, one of the biggest barriers in terms of getting into the market was simply getting access to spectrum. So um, uh, GSM spectrum or mobile spectrum uh, uh, at that point had largely been taken up by, by um, a few incumbents in, uh, in each country and it was very difficult to, to actually get into the mobile market. And uh, in general regulators have been a bit slow to release new spectrum for, um, for use. So one opportunity that remained was to look at unlicensed spectrum. So Wi-Fi falls into that category. And it happened to be at the time when uh, Wi-Fi technology was both dramatically increasing in power while dropping in price. So suddenly we had these very, very inexpensive but powerful Wi-Fi devices that were being used as you know, access points in people's homes or in cafes, hotels, airports. And the potential was there to, to actually deliver this as, as broadband infrastructure. In particular, using um, something called meshed Wi-Fi, which is uh, in a... What, and what, what is mesh Wi-Fi? Well, in a, in a traditional environment, um, you have one Wi-Fi access point and all the devices around it connect in a kind of star fashion to that central point, which is then connected to the internet. Um, so there's a kind of master and... Uh, client uh, relationship. With meshed Wi-Fi, um, the Wi-Fi devices themselves are both master and client at the same time. They are peers, in effect, with each other and can transit voice and data uh, across each other to, um, to create a kind of wireless cloud. So that even if you have a device over here um, and it can't see the device you know, all the way over here, if you have a device in the middle, it can act as a repeater and then that, that scales and repeaters in various directions. So, um, the so it's like a honeycomb jigsaw puzzle of sort of, that sort of thing, pieces yeah. that fit together. Yeah. So the more devices you have, the stronger your network becomes because you introduce redundancies mm -hmm. uh, so that even if one device fails, they can still use the other devices to create the network. So this uh, was an idea that um, had been used successfully by a number of companies in the, in the US, um, Meraki, OpenMesh, to create uh, Wi-Fi data networks in, uh, in quite a you know, radically alternative uh, format to, to how traditional wireless infrastructure has been deployed. But in Africa, um, uh, in, in the rural areas, to actually just deliver internet without actually delivering affordable voice, um, would be a barrier to the sort of adoption and scale. Bit of a, bit of a crazy technology. idea, really. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the, I mean, the telecenter movement to try to do that in the, in the 90s in terms of, you know, plonking down access and actually integrating the two makes, makes a, a lot more sense. But uh, the challenge was that um, um, nobody made a device or technology that, that, that easily and seamlessly integrated the two. You need, you need two things then. You need wi a Wi-Fi device and what's called an, an analog telephony adapter to be able to plug an ordinary phone into, into the internet. So the device actually is perfectly capable of simply taking a, a phone and being plugged into it and, and working straight off the bat. Absolutely. So these, the, the, the device, we call them a, a mesh potato. It's a bit of a long story to that, but it's a catchy name, we've found. And um, they, uh, these devices, you plug them in, uh, and they will automatically form uh, a peer network, a cloud, and you plug, um, plug an ordinary phone into them um, and uh, you can start making calls. Uh, completely independent of the telephone or internet network. So they don't actually need to be connected to a telephone or internet network to actually function as a, as a local telephone network. And the interesting thing about that is that... Um, so how is the interconnection done then? How, how, how would I 
put up my mashed potato and immediately be phoning somewhere? How, how, how does that occur? Well, then one of these devices needs to be connected to uh, an internet gateway. And through that internet gateway, you could then connect into um, the public switch telephone network, into voice over internet service providers, um, or simply offer internet services as well. So this is not just a, a telephone device, but it's also a, uh, an inter internet device. Hmm. So how was the device invented? Because there's a, it's, it's not just a device, it's a whole community behind that device, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, one of the first things I did was to, was to bring some of the smartest people I knew in the, in the realm of um, wireless networking and um, together for a week-long workshop to sort of look at the problem. And it became ev evident that, um, that this problem of not having the right device was, was a big one. And, uh, and up until that time, um, our approach to the problem was to look at how can we take commodity, you know, North American, European hardware and adapt it to, to our needs. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, not only some very creative people there, but uh, a brilliant uh, open hardware designer by the name of David Rowe, who at one point during the proceedings uh, said, you know, why don't we build our own? Mm -hmm. And that, um, uh, that took a lot of, a bit of getting my head around because I, I thought, you know, um, there's no way that we could do that. But it, uh, um, the more we talked about it, the, the more appealing the idea came. And so we did some exploration and uh, got David to sort of... Um, uh, prototype what a device would look like and uh, talked, had some preliminary talks with a, um, um, a manufacturer in Shenzhen, China. And that's, that's ATCOM, isn't it? That's right. Who, yeah. are now, who are now making the devices. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, the, uh, we just, things kept working. And um, and it became you know it began to seem more and more feasible and in the end you know uh, here we are with a with a completely robust um, commercial product that uh, has in a way sort of short circuited the global supply chain going from from South Africa to China via Australia where David's from and uh, I think that's that's quite remarkable it says you know that you don't. You, you don't actually have to be a... Uh, it doesn't have to be know, made in North America. A, a Cisco or a, um, you know, an Atheros to actually build, uh, to build your own appropriate uh, technology. And it, and it is appropriate technology in the sense that we didn't just take commodity Wi-Fi uh, device and sort of package it with uh, an analog telephony adapter. We did more than that. We, uh, we made sure that all the ports... Uh, were hardened to withstand the very tough conditions that uh, that they're um, likely to experience. So, that anything short of a direct lightning strike, um, the mashed potato will simply you know fall over and get back up again. Uh, we've designed it to be as low power as possible. It only consumes uh, about two and a half watts even in full operation, which means you can power it with a fairly small solar panel. Uh, it'll take. Uh, a range of voltage from 10 to 40 volts, which means that you can power it with a car battery uh, or a range of power sources. So we've designed it to be kind of like the, uh, you know, the Land Rover of Wi-Fi devices. And what's the software that drives the, the, the processes? The, um, it's based on an open source uh, uh, operating system for embedded devices called OpenWRT. And um, it's a... Uh, uh, runs a mesh networking protocol called Batman, and one of the core developers of Batman, uh, Electra, actually works on our our team. And uh, and it uh, has so well, the person who invented Batman was the same person who invented the the mesh potato as a name. Uh, no, no, that was more of a group effort. But uh, <laughs> the um, uh, uh, and it runs a, an embedded version of Asterisk, so this which is yeah. the so open source. Um, Telephony, PABX PABX software, so, yeah. it, uh, so it's actually a quite a powerful, flexible device. And, and because it's open source, you can actually download all sorts of other packages uh, to, for this to do um, different things, such as you know, traffic shaping or encryption or all that sort of thing. We yeah. are actually able to leverage the open source community to, uh, to move forward quite quickly with this. And how much does that device cost? So uh, it, um, it retails for $119, and um, though in quantity, the discounts are up to about 43% uh, uh, are available, depending on okay. how many you buy, basically. Okay. 
And where where is it being used? What's the what's the current so we've range got, um, of places? We've got a number of, uh, of pilot networks. One in the capital of uh, East Timor in Dili, which is uh, run by um, an NGO called Fong Til, which is busy using the mashed potato to connect um, all the NGOs working in uh, East Timor. Um, we have um, a network in a um, Muslim community of Cape Town called Bokap, which is, uh, which is a pilot in which we're working with the community uh, to... to uh, we've given them 100 uh, mesh potatoes in exchange for sort of their feedback on how the technology mm. works and how we can improve it. And what's the feedback coming back from them? Uh, well, uh, so uh, it is quite interesting uh, on a number of levels. One, uh, the demand for the, uh, the device actually um, is most vocal from the wealthier members of the community, um, uh, which we didn't expect. And um, I guess that's how they got wealthy. <laughs> the, uh, um, and, and then that has actually acted as a stimulus for other people to, to adopt it. Uh, we found that it's quite powerful simply by following uh, a social network. So we didn't, we didn't um, advertise widely we actually started with one family who ran a cafe called the Noon Gun Cafe and followed their sort of family and friends into, into the community. And then word sort of sprang out through, through neighbors and through, through family to uh, um, expand the, um, the realm of the network. And what's interesting about that is it turns out to be a very high, a high value, powerful way of setting up a telephone network because these people already want to talk to each other. So we know that there's a strong mm. demand for these people to communicate with each other so that, um, you know, we, uh, we got to very high usage um, in, in, a, in a way that uh, a traditional telephone company couldn't. So I think, you know, there's a, there are sort of general metrics about critical mass for, for telephone companies and kind of the, the penetration that they have to have in order to achieve um, you know, the kind of network effects to survive. Well, that doesn't seem to apply to the village telco um, as uh, we can actually be, you know, extremely targeted in terms of who we deploy these to and create very, very um, high value but small networks. And are there any deployments in uh, rural areas as we were talking about earlier? The, um, so um, a company called uh, Dava in Johannesburg run by Rail is, is um, has a deployment in a township south of uh, Johannesburg called Orange Farm, which is still um, at its embryonic stages, but uh, there are about, uh, about 50 or so um, nodes in, in that network. And we're working with a, um, an e-health organization in the Philippines to roll out uh, the mesh potato as a kind of... Um, complementary tool for health services delivery for rural doctors. And so in a year's time, where will the, where will the village telco be? Well, uh, the village telco will always be a kind of niche complementary product to uh, existing uh, mobile networks. And if you think about mobile networks, you know, they're, um, uh, they, um, they're kind of fractal in that they have, lot, you know, they have very large perimeters that uh, where services either sort of um, um, are marginal. Yeah, marginal or, yeah. you know, or slightly beyond non-existent. And that's mm. where we see the village telco operating, is in, in, at the sort of margins of, uh, of mobile networks. And um, by next year, I hope we'll have, uh, we'll have thousands of sort of these emergent networks who are beginning to, you know, extend services at the edges of telephone networks. And those will be small-scale operators interconnecting with the larger network, or what, what form will that, those, those services take? Um, I think it will vary in, in, in some circumstances, so um, uh, depending on who's driving it. So if you're a wireless ISP in South Africa, there's no reason not to, not to use a mesh potato as a value-added service for, um, uh, for the kind of wireless service delivery that you're doing. If you're um, a, an organization or an entrepreneur at the kind of fringes of, um, of telephone networks, then, I mean, there's, there's a real scope for sort of franchising uh, the idea that, that once you've built a network, then it's easy to actually replicate that idea across other networks. And, of course, the potential to, to interconnect uh, mm. village telcos and actually completely bypass the, uh, the, telephone, uh, the traditional telephone infrastructure. So for um, diaspora communities and that sort of thing, that uh, holds some potential. Very powerful. Yeah. Mm. Steve, thanks for talking to me today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you.